Hi, Bubakar. So I think we can go ahead. I'll be admitting people as and when they come in. As they come, okay. Good. Um, maybe we should give one minute. Maybe my clock is not, my computer's time is not correct. It says one minute for 34 on my phone. Okay. We should start now. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Can everybody hear me, right? Um, welcome to our maiden seminar of uh, AIMS, and we call it the AIMS Virtual Research Seminar. And we are happy to have uh, Dr. Nya to give the first talk. Um, so we would we plan to make this uh, a monthly one, and we are all forced by COVID-19 to be innovative in terms of how to keep up on, on workshops and conferences. So I thank uh, the committee members. Unfortunately, I haven't seen many of them here yet. Okay, but they are Mama Mufungyani uh, at Kems uh, Ems uh, Cameroon, Olivier Pamen at Ems uh, Ghana, uh, Mustafa Fall at Ems uh, Senegal, myself at Ems South Africa, and Sila. Bamba Silla at uh, Ames Rwanda and uh, Wilfred at Ames NEI. And Samson, uh, of course, at uh, Ames NEI. And he's the man behind all this logistical setup. So we thank uh, Samson too. Okay, so the idea of, uh, of this is to kind of uh, keep us abreast on what is going on with research around the world in mathematical sciences and in other words, to motivate most of the younger alumni and probably those in, in the AIMS network currently doing uh, programs, to, uh, I motivate them by inter to exposing them to state-of-the-art problems that people are working on that are very interesting, uh, probably to their careers too. Okay, so we would want we would suggest speakers we would come up with speakers as a committee but people also we want this to be more participatory people can also suggest speakers if you know somebody in your community who you think uh, is doing great work and you want to share you would like him to share his work with us you're welcome to to, to to propose a speaker and we would put out a link where people can propose speakers okay Okay, I something just put that link on the chat. You can have the click on that and you can suggest names of speakers. If you don't want to contact them directly, we can contact them if you put their details there. Okay. So you can either contact any of the committee members that I just mentioned if you also have a, a suggestion for a speaker. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker today, uh, Eddie Na Nyan. He's originally from Togo and currently uh, an assistant professor at uh, John Hopkins University at the Department of uh, Applied Mathematics and Statistics. He grew up in Togo, like I said, did his high school there, then went on to, to Canada, Montreal, University of Montreal. He did his uh, undergrad and then moved to the US. At Rutgers, he did his PhD. And after his PhD, he did a First postdoc at the Institute, Institute of Advanced Study and his second postdoc at, at Purdue University. Now he's uh, on this uh, tenure track position at John Hopkins and he's going to talk to us about uh, the on the Kotzig Ring Gel Rosa conjecture. I just want to make a quick comment about him. Two things. First, he is a big fan of AIMS, so you should know that about him. So he's a big AIMS ambassador in the US. So he talks about him a lot. The other thing is he works on very deep maths problems. When I first uh, met him when we were talking, at one point we were talking about the uh, sinkhorn algorithm, you know. And we didn't realize, okay, I didn't realize that then this has any application currently. But afterwards, shortly after I was in a talk where people are talking about optimal transport and machine learning, and people have start, are using this algorithm to do stuff, okay? So yeah, he's, 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 he's an amazing guy. And let's hear what he's going to talk to us about. OK, Eddie, you go ahead. All right. Uh, everybody can hear me. If you can't, 
uh, Bubaka or uh, Sam, Samson, let me know. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be giving the first talk in this series. Um, this COVID crisis has been trying us in many ways, but it's a pleasure to be able to share some mathematics with uh, fellow brothers. So uh, I'm going to share with you some exciting results uh, which have occurred very recently in the field of graph theory, which is an area I dabble in from time to time. And it's related to one of the oldest graph theory problems um, in the area. So let's say more about it. Uh, the plan for the talk, I have very few slides, so I'm going to try to go as slow as possible. I'm not assuming that you are a graph theorist. I'm going to define everything and uh, explain what are graph decomposition. I'm going to try and motivate graph decompositions. And then I'm going to give the details about the Kotzik Ringel Rosa conjecture and some recent developments, which are very exciting. All right. Then, since, as I said, there's not many slides, there's going to be ample time for questions. I encourage questions uh, to, after the talk. We have plenty of time for questions and discussion sessions. All right, so let's jump can right I, in. Can Go I ahead. make a quick comment? Yes. So people can submit questions through the chat if they want uh, as we are going along. But uh, yeah, like he said, we would allow you to also ask questions by unmuting you, and you can ask questions at the end of the talk. But as we go on now, you can sort of submit questions through the chat. Okay. Yes, and, and I'll periodically check in the chat to see if there are any questions so I can address them as I go along. So if you something, just type it in, and I'll take a look periodically to see. All right, so uh, let's jump straight ahead. Let's talk about graph decompositions. So in network studies, we're very interested in partitioning network into pieces, canonical pieces on which we want to run algorithms. One good example of such a scenario is imagine the social network on Facebook and Facebook wanting to run some particular algorithm on their network. Now, in order to divide and conquer their network, they actually want to divide their network into small pieces and run their algorithm in parallel on these pieces. So generic procedures for breaking uh, graphs into pieces which have some definite shape is a convenient thing to do. And that's exactly what graph decomposition means. So if I give a start with a graph G and I split it into pieces GK, then I say that GK is a graph decomposition if they don't overlap. There's no edge overlap between the different parts. So the parts of the graph have to be edge disjoint. And if you take the union of all the parts, you should recover the graphs. Now, from this definition, it's clear that if you split the graph into its edges, so the edges are the segments which connect the vertices, if you take your parts to be just edges, then that's a trivial partition. And typically, we're not interested in trivial partition. We're interested in partitions that have some nice properties. And as we go along, I will explain what nice means. So in the example that I just showed, I'm featuring what's called the complete graph on four vertices. It's complete because there is a line segment between any two edges. And I've colored in blue one partition, and I'm colored in black another partition. So you can see that every edge in this complete graph on four vertices is either black or blue. And as a result, we have a valid partition. But what's interesting in this setting is that both partitions are copies of the same graph. The first black partition is a path. The second partition is also a path. So it's interesting that uh, uh, it's interesting that in our setting, we're able to decompose the complete graph on four vertices into these two copies of the same graph. Another similar example is uh, a partition for K5. K5 is the complete graph on five vertices. 
in this setting, we're no longer partitioning it into, into paths. We're partitioning it into cycles. So G0, you should think of G0 as being the blue part. This is the cycle on five vertices. And G1, you should think of as being the graph in black, the subgraph in black. And if you take the union of these two, this edge destroying subgraph, you get the whole graph. Now here again, the graphs are the same. And this is actually a very important feature. You want to be able to say that you sort of have partitioned your graph into parts which are equal size and have the same graph theoretical properties. And this is a recurring theme. And the question we want to ask is, can we always do something of this sort? Now, this conjecture was raised at the first ever graph theory conference in 1964. In 1964, Ringel and others had a list of problems. And Ringel suggested that this partition can basically always be done uh, in terms of a tree. Now, in computer science, we love trees because trees are graphs that are very easy to understand and they are very easy to recurse on. So if you can partition a very complicated network into disjoint copies of trees, then you have a very good algorithm for proceeding to a divide and conquer step. So exactly this year, in 2020, this conjecture was raised since 1964. It's one of the oldest conjecture. Exactly this year, early on, right before the COVID crisis hit, uh, two groups uh, independently suggested a proof of this conjecture. So they were a, a, a few months apart. They posted on archive the first outstanding proof of the conjecture. And it was a major tour de force. They pushed the methods that we know in graph theory, uh, probabilistic method, to the extreme. And what they showed is that if you start with any tree on n vertices, as the one illustrated on the left, you can use that tree as a template to decompose another, uh, the complete graph on two n minus one vertices. And what they showed is that not only can you do this decomposition, but the decomposition can always be done in such a way that it's cyclic, which means you can rotate that tree around and cover all the other edges. So in the drawing that I just displayed, if you rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, Red edges cover all the red edges in the complete graph. Green edges are going to move outside the polygon, so to speak. And the blue edges move along. So this sort of decomposition is actually much more than what Ringel was hoping for. Ringel was just hoping for a decomposition. And what they were able to show is that our strongest claim holds, which is known as the ringel kotzig conjecture, which says, you can decompose the complete graph in such a way that it's cyclic. You can rotate around. So this was an ascending result. However, when the problem was first raised, uh, there was a stronger conjecture that was even made. And that conjecture is the one we're really interested in today, for which there's some interesting developments. So the stronger conjecture was made by Rosa. And that stronger conjecture is called the kotzig ringel rosa conjecture. The kotzig ringel rosa conjecture says that not only can you decompose the complete graph into copies of a trees, but you can decompose it in such a way that the vertices are consecutive. And to understand this, it's important to go back to what we had before. If you look at the particular decomposition that we have here, it involved vertices three, four, five, six, and then we skip vertex seven and vertex eight and use the vertex labeled zero. So we have not used consecutive vertices along the polygon. We've sort of allowed ourselves to skip some vertices. And in the proof that have been proposed this year, it's sort of hard to constrain the argument to use consecutive vertices. Now, the Rosa conjecture suggests that you can actually do it using consecutive vertices. Now, why is that interesting? If I illustrate what it means, I can start with a particular decomposition. So here is a, a tree. And if I can use consecutive vertices, what happens 
is that the tree appears to be moving around the, the graph. Now, this is very appealing for somebody who has appealed to analysis, because you can actually think about this as a discrete analog of a soliton wave. So because you're using consecutive vertices, what you're basically saying is that there's some local neighborhood of the vertex. And the graph is basically propagating around your graph. So even if you like partial differential, discrete partial differential equations, you can actually apply some of these arguments to this setting. And this is sort of the inspiration for the approach that I'm going to describe. So the ringel rosa conjecture is much harder. And there's some interesting development and an approach which I'm suggesting to actually attack the conjecture, which is, uh, I believe, suggests a proof. So let's discuss how we're going to accru actually approach this slightly more constrained version of the conjecture. So to recap where we stand, today in 2020, early 2020, uh, two groups of mathematicians has proved that you can decompose the complete graph into disjoint copies of trees. Rosa made in 1964 the conjecture that you can actually use consecutive vertices. This is much harder to show. And basically, we're making progress toward actually answering this question. And we believe the answer is yes. However, the proof technique is going to be very different. I'm going to, in this talk, give an overview of the ideas that we're going to use to actually prove uh, this stronger version of the conjecture. But before I do this, let me just check to see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. So this, you, you're talking about complete graphs. What, what happens when you have graph, graphs that are not complete? Excellent. That's a great question. So it turns out that if you have a graph which is not complete, then the statement says you will have a partition of, uh, as long as the graph is dense, you have a partition where the tree might change a little in some of the cases. In other words, the complete graph is the hardest case you want to handle. If you can handle the complete graph, then delete the edges that you don't care about. And then you would say you have an approximate decomposition. So on graphs which are not complete but dense, you have an approximate decomposition. And this problem is, is interesting only when your graph is dense because Facebook wants to run an algorithm in parallel on the graph. He wants to decompose the graph into small pieces. If it's dense, what this theorem ensures is that there's a partition that allows you to run your algorithm in parallel. Did I answer your question? Yes. All right. Any other question? All right, uh, I welcome questions. I will stop periodically to give a chance to ask questions. So as I said, these are very old conjectures and they, they've been around for, for a very long time and they're typically used to test our new techniques, techniques that we have in graph theory. And they've resisted a lot of the tools that we have up until now. And very recently, we are making headway on these very hard problems. All right. So, as I said, the approach that I suggest to attack the Ringel Rosa conjecture is very different from the approach that was proposed in the, in the recent papers, which uh, have been uh, posted on archive early this year. What appeals to me about the problem is the connection with uh, partial differential equations, wave propagation in media. And if you study partial differential equations, the one thing that comes up are solution to partial differential equations. And solution to differential equations are typically functions. So one of the things we're going to do is go we're going to switch perspective. Instead of thinking about trees as graphs, I really want to think about trees as functions. And I want to explain what this means. So what does it mean to be thinking about a tree as a function? I want to illustrate what happened in the very specific setting of this blue tree here. So you can see that zero is, has an edge with one. There's an edge between one and, and 10. I mean, in this setting, let me, uh, sorry. 
let me take the graph which has the smallest. So we see that we have vertices connecting uh, six consecutive vertices, starting from zero all the way up to five. And if I look at the graph that I have at the end here, I'm connecting five, six vertices as well. It's the exact same graph. Now to convert the tree into a function, what you do is you place a loop edge anywhere on that tree. It doesn't matter where you place the loop edge. For convenience, I've chosen to place the loop edge at the vertex, which is labeled zero. And GF is the list of all the edges of the graph. Once you've placed the loop edge, you treat the loop edge as if it was a fixed point for a function. Therefore, the function at zero outputs the number zero. And you treat, you orient all the other edges of the graph so that they are pointing towards the loop, the fixed point. So the edge one, two, for example, is pointing towards zero because every vertex, every edge is trying to point towards the so-called fixed point. Once you do this, every vertex has out degree exactly one edge coming out, and this defines a function. It's interesting to observe that every rooted tree describe a distinct function. And in this particular case, I'm describing a function which has the property that f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 2, f of 2 is 0, f of 3 is 0, f of 4 is 0, and f of 5 is 0. So every time you give me a tree, I can pick a, a loop, a fixed point, put a loop edge over there, and uh, orient all the edges to point towards the fixed point. And this allows me to convert trees into functions. And again, I said, I'm inspired by what's happening in partial differential equations. So solutions for me are functions. And you can turn every tree into a function. Let me pause here to make sure uh, there are any questions, uh, because this is a crucial part of the argument. Any questions so far? All right, if there are no questions, let's move on to the next step. So what do we do once we have this function? It turns out that the Kotzik Rosa showed that the conjecture, the decomposition that we seek, this decomposition with the wave, discrete wave propagating along the cycle, exists if and only if we can relabel this so-called functions such that the absolute difference along every edge is a distinct number. And this is a very important fact. So let's actually look at what we mean. So for every edge, you should think about vertices as cities. Let's say cities uh, somewhere in Ghana is a good example. And you should think about the, the edges as road segments. What you want to do is assign names to the road segments. And the way you assign names to the road segment is by taking the absolute value of the difference of the endpoints. So the road segment between 1 and 2 is going to be called road number 1 because the absolute value between 2 and 1 is 1. The road segment between 2 and 0, I'm going to call it road number 2 because the absolute value difference between 2 and 0 is 2. If I look at the roads that span 0 and 4, I'm going to call it road number 4, because the absolute difference between 0 and 4 is 4. So this scheme of naming roads by taking the absolute difference of the endpoints uh, is, was proposed by Rosa. That's why it's called the uh, Rosa's conjecture, the Kosi Gringel Rosa's conjecture. And if every street has a distinct name, the labeling is called graceful. So Rosa showed that the decomposition that we seek exists if and only if there's a way of naming the cities, giving numbers to the cities, such a way that each road has a distinct name. And he showed that if this is true, uh, it buys you the decomposition that you want, a decomposition in terms of consecutive segments. This problem in of itself is extremely appealing. Uh, it's been called a disease because it's very easy to state 
but showing that every tree admits uh, graceful labeling is very hard uh, if you just attack it brute force. So let's try and see how we can go about reformulating this in the language of uh, functions. First of all, I have to tell you, formally speaking, what does it mean for a function to, to describe a rooted tree? So a function describes a rooted tree if it has a fixed point. And remember, the fixed point is the loop edge. The other condition is that it has to be connected. And the way you describe that a function is connected, you say that the fixed point has to be attractive over the whole domain. Every, every point that you start from, if you apply the function to the points, you eventually reach the fixed points. So for example, if you start at vertex 1 and you apply the function once, you go to 2. If you apply the function twice, you go to 0. If you apply the function again, you stay at 0. So the condition that I just written here says if you apply the function n minus 1 time, where n is the number of vertices, to any point in the domain, you have to reach the fixed point. That's basically what the condition says. So rooted trees are functions which have a fixed point, which is attractive over the whole domain. And this actually comes up in the so-called uh, Banach contraction mapping theorem. You should, you should think the perfect setup for these are functions which satisfy the so-called Banach contraction mapping. These are a very good example. Now, what is the kotzik ringel rosa conjecture, this naming street convention? What is it saying? Well, the way we can write it formally is as follows. If you give me a function which has a unique attractive fixed point and attractive over the whole domain, it is a solution to our decomposition problem if the maximum number of street names is equal to the number of vertices. That's basically what this condition at the bottom of the equation says. Now, this switch in perspective from graph theory to discussing properties of functions it's not a commonly used approach. This is the contribution that we're suggesting for studying this theorem. We started from a graph theory problem. It's very hard to solve if you try pure graph theoretical methods. But if you study analysis and insight coming from differential equations, it actually suggests ideas for approaching the problem. And basically, that's the switch in perspective that we're suggesting here. So how do we prove this claim? How do we prove that every time that you have a function with a unique attractive fixed point, the maximum over the absolute differences over all ways of relabeling the graph is going to be n? So before I jump into discussing sketch for the proof, let me pause to see if there are any questions uh, so far. Any questions? All right, uh, no question. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Let me make sure. Uh, I guess can everybody can hear you. <laughs> OK, all right. OK, good. So now, let me, once I've changed the setup, let's actually discuss how we're going to prove this statement. We want to prove the statement for all functions which have a unique attractive fixed point. And there is, on n vertices, there n to the power n minus 1 of them. So that's a lot of functions to consider. However, if you want to prove this claim, it's enough to prove the claim on a subset of these functions. It's enough to prove the claim on functions which have a very special property. The function is such that when you apply it to a vertex i, you always point to a smaller number. In other words, if you follow the edges, you're always decreasing. If we can prove that the theorem holds for this very small subset of functions, then it implies that the statement is true for all the other functions. Now, this subset of functions is a very nice subset of functions. First of all, that subset has size n minus 1 factorial instead of n to the power n minus 1. But what's particularly nice about the, the subset is that it's closed on the composition. It forms what we call a semigroup. So ideas from group theory and algebra can help you. So how do we go about doing this? In the very limited time that I have, let me give you the idea for how to prove that this, this statement that we want to show holds. We do this by showing an inequality. 
a very surprising inequality. I've searched in the literature for similar inequality. I've yet to find one. But this inequality turns out to buy us the result we want. Let me parse uh, the inequality, which I call the composition lemma, what it says. It says, remember, that the set of functions that we're considering here is closed on the composition. If you compose two functions, you get a new function in the set. So it says, if you start with a tree, which is ma made by composing two functions, if you start with two rooted trees, a rooted tree built by composing two functions from the sets, the number of labels is always smaller or equal to the number of labels from, of the function you started out with. So this is a very innocent looking inequality, but this inequality turns out buys us the theorem. Because if you start with a function which is a tree, by composing that function with the identically zero function, the identically zero function belongs to this set, uh, then we see that the number of labels on the left-hand side is going to be n, and this buys us that the number of labels, edge labels, the street names, for f also must be n. So the hard work for proving, using this approach for proving the, the cosic ringel rosa conjecture is to prove this, this inequality. And as I said, this is not the typical way as a graph theorist, this is not a typical way that a graph theorist approaches a problem like this. Uh, but if you like analysis, it seems like a very natural way to proceed. OK, so how do we prove this inequality? Well, unfortunately, we only prove it by contradiction. Uh, a combinatorist like myself prefers a uh, constructive proof. But as far as, as, as of today, uh, the only proof I know is a proof by contradiction. I assume that the statement is false. And I consider very special function, a function which basically sum over all possible ways of relabeling the, the graphs. And I show that this function actually counts the number of nice labelings. And if I assume that the inequality does not hold, it leads to the contradiction that the number of labelings is the same for both functions. But this contradicts exactly what we had assumed. Therefore, uh, we run into trouble. So if we negate this lemma, we basically run into the contradiction that the function have the same number of nice labelings, and that can't be the case if the inequality here is true. That's basically the bird's eye view of the proof. And the proof uses uh, techniques which are elementary, just algebraic techniques, but uh, very interesting. And I recommend any of you to take a look at the latest version that I posted on archive, uh, which should appear later today, actually. OK, so uh, now some consequences. If you're not a graph theorist and you look at this, you may ask, uh, what does this do for me? It turns out that it actually spells out some limitation of spectral graph theory or spectral methods in general. You can consider the following problem. Suppose I have a matrix A. I can multiply the matrix A on the left by an invertible matrix Q, and I multiply it on the right by the inverse of Q. Look at the absolute value of the largest entry of that matrix and pick Q to make that value as small as possible. It turns out that solving this optimization problem is very similar to finding the decomposition we want. And you can see that the way we're choosing this invertible matrix does not change the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues uh, of the resulting matrix are the same. However, our optimization problem is trying to make the maximum entry in absolute value as small as possible. And this basically suggests that methods of eigenvectors and eigenvalue decomposition alone is not going to be enough. So this suggests that this functional approach uh, that we're describing is basically pushing us one step further from spectral techniques and 
it's an approach that I very much encourage uh, exploring and I suspect might be useful for other combinatorial problems. All right. So this basically concludes the brief overview. And for the rest of the talk, I'm eager to answer your questions or hear your comments and uh, basically engage in a conversation uh, amongst ourselves. Thank you. You can hear people clapping. Thank you very much for that illuminating talk. Yeah. Aha. Yes. So I just saw a question posted by. Question came from Castle, I think I saw. Yes. So so I can I can answer Castle's question. So, uh, where's the matrix A coming from? That's a very good question. You should think about A as the adjacency matrix, as the adjacency matrix of the complete graph. But we believe that this inequality holds for any matrix. That the fact that we're doing this for adjacency matrix is basically an artifact. So you should think about A as the, uh, the adjacency matrix of the complete graph. And or you, you can think about the A squared or some other matrix as the adjacency matrix of the tree. Actually, I think it's better to think about it as a larger matrix where uh, most of it is 0 and a few entries are non-zero. And the non-zero entries correspond to the tree. And the conjugation multiplying on the left and multiplying on the right by Q and Q inverse really is the equivalent to moving the tree around. So it's a unitary transformation uh, acting on both sides. Now, the transformation is going to preserve the eigenvalues, definitely. But what we want is the edges not to overlap. So this condition that the maximum entry should be as small as possible is equivalent as to saying, I never want two edges to, to collide. And to force the edges not to collide, you ask the maximum entry to be distinct. And that's really where this condition is coming from. So it's saying, if you are allowed to rotate around, conjugate your matrix, how much can you smear, smear the maximum entry around your, your graph? And this, I find, is a very hard problem to solve if you don't invoke combinatorics. As a matter of fact, I don't know any linear algebra or analysis argument for actually solving for Q. And it's a problem I'm very much interested in. The only example that I know how to solve for this quantity, the infimum, the smallest uh, you can get the maximum entry to be, which is basically smearing around the maximum entry by conjugation, uh, I don't know how to solve it without using combinatorics. Uh, linear algebraic technique analysis techniques have thus far failed me. So let me make sure I answered Kasso. So Kasso, have I answered your question? Where is the yes. matrix A coming from? Okay, yes. great. And, and also one more thing. So well, the maximum norm that you're using, that yes. just like the maximum entry wise, is that absolutely. what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's maximum entry wise. So absolute value, you take the absolute value of all the entries and you want the maximum. And I want that to be as small as possible. So fix the eigenvalues, and, conjugate, and make that maximum as small as possible. So in other words, what you're talking about is uh, you're comparing the maxi, uh, because the quantity you have on your left is essentially like the conjugation of uh, A squared, right? Absolutely. That is exactly it. I'm comparing the maximum for A squared and the maximum for A. And okay. the inequality that I wrote before is a combinatorial version of the one that I'm writing below. And oh. one of the reasons okay. I'm, I'm giving this talk is because I'm hoping that an analyst has a, an idea why this would be true for, for A's in general. Did I answer your question, Kaso? Yes. So if okay. you're thinking about A being like a uh, adjacency matrix, yes, so... A sparse adjacency matrix for the tree. So you have a matrix of size in, the, in our problem. It's a 2n, by, 2n minus 1 by 2n minus 1 matrix, which only has n non-zero entries. And all these non-zero entries are equal to 1. And Q is basically doing the rotation. It rotates around that matrix to fill in the complete graph. OK. Right, so, so the picture, the matrix picture I have is exactly this. So A is the, A is a two N, is a, in this case, 11 by 11 matrix. The only entries of the matrix which are equal to one is where the blue guy is. Everything, all the black edges are zero. 
And then what Q does, it basically moves the blue edges around. And by the time you do this, you cover the whole graph. You cover the complete graph. So okay. here, you don't see, I did not show what's happening with the squaring. The squaring is going to do something to the function. It basically going to turn that function into a new function. And basically, what I'm arguing is that the inequality holds. I don't know how to show that if A is not an adjacency matrix, but the theorem really begs for an analysis statement. I believe this is true for every matrix, and I don't yet know how to prove it. I don't even know how to solve for Q in, in general. Is it, is it possible? Do you think you can replace A first by something that, uh, like, uh, the corresponding Laplacian, like, do you think it's going to make it easier to analyze? If rather than taking the adjacency, you look at the corresponding Laplacian and then try to see if you can use that. So Laplacian definitely comes up in the proof of the argument. I don't see how Laplacian would help, but you can replace A by the Laplacian because the Laplacian basically amounts to subtracting A by a diagonal matrix. So you're changing A by A minus diag, the diagonal matrix of degrees, and it doesn't change much for the problem. Okay. Absolutely. Basically, subtracting the identity doesn't change much to the problem because the identity is fixed by conjugation. So Okay, I see you. Yep. It doesn't okay. change much. Absolutely. Okay. Interesting question. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Any other question? So there's another question I see from Joseph who says, taking a partial differential equation, weak solution to the classical uh, would it work here? That's an awesome question. So first of all, I should say as a disclaimer that I am not uh, a PD or an analyst. As an undergrad, analysis and partial differential equation were my favorite topic. And when I went to Rutgers for grad school, I switched camp and became a combinatorist. What appealed to me in the problem, as I said, is the fact that when n goes to infinity, when n becomes really, really large, it really looks like a wave propagating in the graph. And my, when I touched the problem, I said, well, if we think about it as a discrete differential equation, uh, what does it tell us? Well, I wasn't able to just use differential equation to get the solution. But the differential equation way of thinking about solution is really what led me to think about trees as functions. So. Uh, does taking partial differential equation uh, give me weak classical solution? I don't know the answer. The partial differential equation way of looking at wave propagation in discrete media what is, is what inspired this approach to the problem. But I don't know that if, you, uh, if you're a classical PDE guy, whether you could actually prove the inequality I need uh, using it. In other words, I don't know how to use partial differential equation to prove an inequality like this, uh, the last inequality uh, of, the, of the slide. And if, you, if, you knew, if I knew how to prove this, then the theorem is trivial. It, it, it automatically follows from this, this statement. So I suspect there might be a functional analysis approach to getting inequality of this type. But uh, hopefully, with this confinement period, we'll find it. Any other question? So coming back to uh, you know, this last slide, this square in the fourth, when the left inequality, this is a matrix squaring thing. It's not entry-wise square, right? So the, the square? Yes. Yeah, this, this is matrix squaring. This is matrix it's multiplication. Okay. It, it, it is not. In the, basically, because I'm conjugating, I can actually put the square inside of A, inside mm -hmm. this thing. I can put A square, yeah. yes. So that's the inequality. So if you're not a graph theorist and you like matrices or signal analysis or compress, if you're a Bubakar, basically <laughs> this is the inequality you should prove. Because everything that I'm describing is a uh, is motivation. And the reason I like this inequality is because it's actually a, a statement about optimization. Can you find yeah. Q? If I if I give you a matrix A, how do you find the Q which smears around the maximum entry? You want to smear around, you don't want the magnitude of the entry to be large. You want it to be as small as possible. So you want to smear it as uniformly around, around the matrix as possible. How do you pick Q? And the inequality suggests that looking at eigenvectors and eigenvalues is not going to help much because 
they are fixed. They don't change at all. So you must be using something else to find Q. Did I answer your question, Bubaka? Yeah, sure, sure you did. Um, this is really interesting inequality. Um, yes, any other questions from anybody or yes. comment? Question, comment, ideas. If you've seen an inequality like this before in one of your books, please let me know what is now, because I've been digging during this confinement period for anything of the sort. I haven't found it yet. Uh, can I make a comment? I don't know if this makes yes. sense. Sure, yeah, please yeah. do. So thinking about this, uh, I have a pet project. You, you probably, both of you know about it, this equiangular frame things. Yes, so yes. If, if you think about A being like uh, the gram matrix of, sure. uh, of uh, let's say, if a triangular type frame exists, for instance, if you know that you can construct one, yes. uh, and then you put your A as a, as a gram matrix of that, sure. uh, uh, will this quantity be preserved in this way? In other words, can I sort of assume that I'm looking for something that's not going to be in that class for a triangular? So, and, and then you can sort of see that, I mean, any graph matrix, I believe you can sort of maybe associate it to, to some sort of a graph if you want to. Right. Uh, um, so I wonder if there's a way to sort of say that there are classes of A that I want to exclude because I know if I have both class of A, I maybe see. the inequality, is, it, it can be proved first. I see, I see, I see. For a very specific uh, family of A's. Yes, for uh, specific. I don't know. Right now, I don't know. Uh, okay. it's, it, it's a very interesting prospect. The only matrices for which I know how to prove these inequalities, as I said, are these sparse matrices uh, of zeros and ones. There are other cases where I can, I can barely, I can manage. I mean, I can tell you what the difficulty is. When you switch to graph matrices, for example, the difficulty is actually thinking about how to solve the optimization version of it. Basically, forget the inequality for a second. Think about how to find Q so as to minimize the max, the magnitude of the max entry. I, even algorithmically, I don't know how to prevent brute force. Do you see what I'm saying, Caso? Yes. Um, so, so the first thing is, OK, you, you're only looking at, OK, OK, you're not. So in fact, in fact, from what I'm saying is you actually want your Q not to be unitary, right? Because, uh, because if I was to take like unitary and then A was in this class of, uh, of graph matrix, then I, I believe I can easily guarantee that this inequality will always be true for that class. Oh, I see. Because, I see. Sure. And therefore, so you, you're actually looking at things that are just invertible, not unitary, because I believe if you, if you allow Unita, you could be able to maybe preserve some of these. Uh... I, I believe that the hardest case is unitary. If you can show it that if you can show that this statement is true for the unitary subgroup of GLN, you're done. Oh really? I believe that. I okay. totally believe that the hardest case is to prove it for the unitary subgroup. The others are not changing it by much, right? Diagonal matrix scaling is not changing by much. Okay, so so I also believe then if what you're saying is true, then if you assume that you're in this class of Gramian matrix of and the Gramian matrix come from let's say unique norm vector, yes, then this inequality is true. I see. On, on assuming that you're only looking at the subclass of uh, of, of these uh, Gramian matrices of this Gramian, but also when Q is restricted to be unitary. I the unitary case. I yes. see. I see. I see. So we should totally talk then about Yes, I'm to, not sure how to go about to sort of uh, go from a uh, non-Gramian to a general case. I'm also not sure how to actually establish, like, uh, uh, find what Q will be optimal. Yeah, yeah, you know? sure. No, no. So that was a, this a, a different question. A, any class of matrices, any class of matrices additional to the one I have is progress. So if you know a class of matrices for which I can prove this inequality, that's great. Because that's more let's important. talk. Let's talk, and then maybe I can. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like uh, sure, 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 sure. We we should definitely work it out. And 
this is one of the benefits of giving an AIMS seminar, right? <laughs> you, get, yeah. you get ideas <laughs> and collaboration out of it. So I'm really Absolutely. excited about that. Correct. Yes, any other comments or questions? We still have some time. Olivia Pamen, were you able to hear the speaker? He was complaining about not being oh, able to hear you. Yes, I was. But yes, I was. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Otherwise, I was ready to start again. So, uh, uh, maybe not. <laughs> something maybe strange. So, does it look like a kind of reverse holder inequality what you're trying to prove for matrices? Can you repeat your question again? Is it I didn't like a type of reverse uh, order inequality because you have a square on the left and nothing on the right, which is a oh yeah, yeah. You, I didn't think of it that way, but you could you could you could view it that way. Yes, like a reverse, yeah. And uh, I don't think that in the order inequality you have the infimum. No, you? But I'm just saying uh, you you take a kind of norm and then maybe uh, yeah, it looks like a norm in a square on the left and then the order on the right. So it's like you're taking a norm in those matrices. That's what. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Um, but so, you, you don't have any, uh, for example, if you had a, a constant C, what what will happen? Ah, uh, constant in front would it not make it nice or easier? I don't know if it makes it, or maybe you're normalizing. So so, so I think that the the constant, in other words, if you if I want to look at the constant version, mm -hmm. basically what the constant factor would be, it would be to just focus on the right hand side of the inequality. Let's say forget about this a a square. Mm -hmm. Let me focus on the right hand side and basically try to lower bound or upper bound this quantity. How mm -hmm. small can that thing be? And I think you can express this as the ratio of L2 norm of A by divided by square root of N times some constant. Mm -hmm. So you can make progress that way, but I don't know how to get that actual number exactly. A tight bound for, because for this. Because the, the, the question is, um, is one the sharpest constant that you have? I don't know, because uh, you, may, you may have something maybe uh, bigger, uh, which is not- Yeah, big. some bigger, one, sure. It means that you have a very sharp constant that you know already, but- uh, Sure, sure, know, sure. Just uh, thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good, to relax it a little bit by yeah, maybe allowing relax, for- you put, Maybe we'll put a constant and then see how sharp you can get to that constant. Sure, sure. This is sure. what I, because uh, it's already very um, unnatural to have this kind of uh, uh, bound because I, I mean, it will be, it, it, one would think that the left, to having the left, the left, uh, the right on the left and the left on the right will be the <laughs> oh <laughs> the i see it, it feels natural to switch yeah, the inequality i see but, yes but uh i see i see i see i see i see it, it reminds me of uh, of a um, uh, reverse holder the reverse holder i'll look it up i'll look it up thanks for sharing that's, yeah. a, that's a very good idea i'll look it up definitely thank you So, so, so uh, along the same line, I think, okay, mm -hmm. suppose you can prove this. I mean, I'm trying to push this as much as you can. Suppose you can prove this, right? Yes. Then is it true that you can replace then A by A square and keep iterating this inequality? That's exactly the idea of the proof. Okay. So, so you get a statement like this for A2 to the K or A to the okay. N. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. That's okay. exactly uh, the okay. whole point of the composition lemma is okay. to do this. And you okay. understand very well the limit of the powers of okay. A. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly the idea. Okay. It's to iterate this. This is the simplest okay. case. If you have this, you have the iterative version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have the intuition. So, so you're looking at the, uh, if you're looking at the iterated version, you're looking at the limit then. Uh, yes. Because, okay. so, so basically, you have A squared, you have A to the power of 4. So mm -hmm. you, you can actually write down the limit, a to the 2n, uh -huh. and ask, how does it compare? And, and basically, the idea for the proof of the paper is exactly that observation. Because in the case of trees, this sequence converges to the identically constant zero function. And the identically constant zero function has trivially n distinct edge labels. So in the discrete case, the iterative argument is key. Not only does it prove the theorem, but it actually gives an algorithm for finding the labeling, finding the partition. 
And, so, and did you say you posted the paper already or it's going to be posted tomorrow? So uh, this is a, a very it's a fascinating story. Um, the first draft of the paper was posted uh, 2018, November 2018. And I kept getting feedback, people suggesting revisions to the proof until I converge now to the last version. Okay. So the last version has been posted yesterday and it will be available on archive tonight. Tonight, okay. So, so tonight you should be able to have the last version. I, there's no more okay. changes. The proof is okay. as simple as I can get it and the inequality is there. Unfortunately, it's a proof by contradiction. I'm hoping to see a constructive proof soon. Okay. Via okay. this inequality. Okay. Awesome. Bubakar, thank you very much for um, inviting me. It's a great, great. honor. And, and great this honor. is a fascinating talk. Uh, we're really honored for you to give this talk. Anybody As I said, I'm a, I'm a big fan of AIMS. I know, that's what I said at the beginning. Like, this is our AIMS ambassador in Baltimore, in the USA. But uh, Mama, you want to say something? Mama is here. Also, one No, it's to, uh, to say hello. Hi, Mama. To it's an honor teacher. to meet you. Yes, really. I enjoyed the talk. I came so minutes late because I got a wrong link. But finally, I, I enjoyed it. And I'm really happy that. Uh, now the we have started and we should keep on going agreed agreed yeah thank you well, for coming well done. i think mustafa um Baka is now in the position to announce the second talk excellent excellent yeah very excited we have somebody for the second talk and that is uh, professor walter from the university of leuven excellent going to give the second talk on the 5th of august Excellent. Did you, did you lose Bubaka? Uh, we lost, I'm not hearing Bubaka. I think maybe he got. Oh, yes. So, so, hello. Did you hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. So, what I was saying is, we have, uh, I have received an email from uh, Mama confirming our next speaker. This awesome. is Professor Walter from uh, University of Leuven, and he's going to talk about orthogonal polynomials and random matrices. Hmm, interesting. Okay, cool. he may have a question, yeah, like an answer to your problem, maybe. Uh, maybe. Absolutely, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to be there. Be sure. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, and there. Kaso has volunteered to give the third talk. This would be in September. So yeah, we okay. already have great speakers lined up. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I look thanks forward to and Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I think if you don't have any more further questions or comments, we would just end now. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bubaka, uh, Edina, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with you guys. Uh, excellent. Okay. Excellent. Thank Thanks talk. again. All right. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. It was a great day. Okay. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.